Uh, and uh, what, what we are looking for is an opening that is this large. Um, usually with, with the first baby, the, the, the mother has uh, a little bit more, she's never done it before. So uh, it takes a little bit longer to open up the, the birth canal. Uh, but all succeeding babies uh, come a lot faster. I think I told you last time that my, my sister-in-law... <clears throat> Her first child, she was in labor for an extended length of time, 16 or 17 hours. And then uh, with her last child, she gave birth in a taxi cab uh, in, the, uh, in the parking lot of the hospital. Uh, that was, it came that quick. There was not much to it, I guess, according to her. Um, and that's the first stage is labor. The second stage is, is where the baby actually emerges from the from the uh, uh, birth canal, this, that baby's actually being born. Third stage is, uh, is when the mother passes the, uh, the placenta, which she doesn't need anymore, and the umbilical cord. Uh, there's no, no reason for it to stay in there, and of course they need to get all of it out. They don't get all of it out, it can cause a lot of, a lot of problems. So. Uh, and the that's the third stage, and then the fourth stage is the mother and the baby recovering. Uh, lots of um, cesarean sections in the United States. Uh, we're not the number one country. Brazil is actually the number one country. Um, once upon a time, this is the only incision that they made for a cesarean section, the uh, vertical incision. Then somebody uh, developed the bikini cut, what they referred referred to as a bikini cut, uh, that's no, it's the horizontal uh, incision. Uh, it hides the scar uh, down close to the, the pubic bone uh, so that uh, she can wear a bikini, I guess. This one goes all the way up to the umbilicus uh, and down to the, the pubic bone. Um, and that's, that's another way to do it if, if uh, she doesn't dilate. Uh, some women choose to, to uh, have cesarean sections rather than a natural delivery. Um, they don't suggest it. Uh, most uh, pediatricians, obstetricians uh, don't like it. Uh, but uh, I guess that's the way it goes. My Both of my kids were cesarean, uh, mainly because my first wife was, was pretty small. Uh, my daughter's child was born cesarean because she's she's really small as well okay there we go okay cesarean births around the world as you can see very popular in uh, in, uh, in the west Australia United States uh, Mexico uh, East uh, Germany uh, Poland Italy and Switzerland uh, I don't know what countries these are not sure that's Turkey and that is I'm not sure what that is uh, anyway Iran I guess that's Iran maybe no that's Saudi Arabia that's Saudi Arabia uh, that, I don't know what that is I, my goodness gracious anyway so uh, lots of countries where the, where cesarean sections are very popular historically only cultural variations um, that deal with the, the, the West. Of course, uh, we had no real doctors uh, in the uh, 15th century. Um, up until the 15th century, midwives were highly respected because uh, they eased the, uh, the pain of the, the childbirth. Uh, some of them had uh, <clears throat> potions that they could give the, uh, the mother uh, from uh, natural potions. Uh, and then in the 15th century, they, because of these pain-killing uh, potions, uh, they started thinking of them as witches. There was this big movement uh, around the world, uh, this big Christian movement around the world, that uh, the people that knew how to, how to make pain go away were witches. And, of course... Uh, at that point, there was nobody to help between the 15th and the, and the 18th centuries. Um, in the 18th century, uh, 
we started developing more uh, medical schools and, and physicians started to, to, to deliver. Um, um, they weren't as, being males, they weren't as uh, sensitive to the, the, the pain that the female was going through. And of course, sometimes that end, ended poorly. Uh, the field of obstetrics started in the 18th century. That's the 1700s. Uh, in the 20th century, uh, the doctors were not properly trained to handle childbirth, as weird as that sounds. Uh, they were uh, trained to handle diseases, uh, but not childbirth, as weird as that sounds. Um, they started using more, more and more drugs. They started knocking women out uh, and sometimes they had problems with the delivery and they would have to uh, pull the baby out with forceps and whatnot because they had knocked her out so, so completely. Um, in the late 20th century, uh, natural childbirth became uh, more and more popular. Uh, my sister believed in this and she, all, of, all four of her children were delivered by midwives uh, on her kitchen table. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that has to do with anything, but, uh, and why she was so adamant about uh, natural childbirth. My, all, all, all my mother's children, my mother was a nurse, so she used to talk about this all the time. Uh, all of her children were born in the uh, 40s and 50s, early 50s. Uh, they knocked her out uh, as soon as she got into the hospital. Uh, she said that she didn't really want it, but uh, that's the way they were doing things at the time, and, and it, she didn't have a say in what was going on as far as, as medicine was concerned. So uh, she was knocked out, and probably so were we. <laughs> uh, with hospital deliveries, no difference in maternal health or neonatal outcomes between uh, natural childbirth and medical methods. Um, some cultures celebrate birth uh, in the Ila, uh, with the Ila of Zimbabwe. Uh, they praise the women and offer them gifts. And these, uh, this is an example of, of the gifts that they might receive. Um, among the Arapesh of uh, New Guinea, they only allow birth on the outskirts of the village in a place reserved for menstruation activities to prevent village contamination. They certainly don't want to contaminate the village with, with blood that has to do with birth. Cultures may have uh, purifying traditions for mothers after she gives birth. Uh, one of the, uh, and, and most people don't, understand, don't recognize this, uh, the Jewish faith uh, feels that a woman, while she's in menstruation or right after she's had uh, a baby is, uh, is tainted and uh, she needs to cleanse herself, uh, as interesting as that is. Um, in some cultures, a placenta has meaning. Uh, some cultures bury the placenta in a sacred place. Some cultures believe that it has value for, hom uh, for hormones and nutrients. Um, Attempts to ease birth process include abdominal massage and herbal teas, uh, herbal medicines to cope with pain. Uh, midwives give instruction and encouragement and symbolic symbols placed in different areas in the, in the birthing chamber or wherever they are. Emotional and social support is important for a woman uh, while she is giving birth. Medical use of epidurals uh, is seen in developed countries uh, where they deaden the pain. It's a, it's a spinal block, the epidural. Um, sometimes there is uh, tissue tearing that takes place, and of course that blocks that. Uh, birthing <clears throat> position also eases pain. Uh, there are upright positions and semi-sitting, uh, half-reclining positions. Placenta is delivered through various methods, umbilical cord may be cut and tied, of course. These are birthing chairs. Uh, this is an old and a new idea. Uh, this is a birthing chair from the, the 18th century. This is a birthing chair from the 20th, 20th, <clears throat> the 20th century, Scandinavia. 
so as you can see, uh, things have changed and things have actually ch stayed the same. Um, neonatal and maternal mortality uh, worldwide, uh, we're pretty good here. Uh, the worst place to give birth to a baby, I guess, would be in Sub-Saharan Africa, where it's dangerous, uh, and in India, and uh, what is that country? Oh my goodness gracious, my brain's not working this morning. I guess it's this cold maternal mortality rates. Uh, women dying from childbirth uh, doesn't happen very often, as you can see. Australia and um, uh, Europe have the have the lowest uh, maternal mortality. Uh, complications of childbirth: uh, the birth trauma may be caused by anoxia, uh, oxygen deprivation. Uh, there are also diseases, infections, or physical injury that can take place uh, during the birth trauma. Uh, when I was, uh, we were stationed in Germany, uh, there was a young lady that worked for my wife uh, who uh, was in an automobile accident and she broke her pelvis uh, in, the, in the accident and uh, turned out she was pregnant, about, about three months pregnant. She didn't know it, as odd as that may seem. She didn't know it at the time and she had to give birth with a broken pelvis, uh, hadn't knitted by the time she uh, she gave birth, so it was a kind of an interesting situation. Uh, they took the baby cesarean so that uh, that uh, uh, her the healing of her pelvis could could continue. So they took the baby a little bit early, not not very much early, before she went into labor uh, to protect her pelvis. Uh, low birth weight babies fall into two categories: preterm and small for date. Uh, a low birth weight baby, if necessary, is placed in, a, in a, an incubator, uh, which is an antiseptic temperature-controlled crib and fed through tubes. I used to work at uh, Children's Hospital in Omaha, um, and uh, we almost all of our babies came uh, into the, or were in incubators. Uh, this is, uh, we were the ones that got all the uh, babies that were in danger of, uh, of having a problem, uh, the babies with uh, uh, birth defects and whatnot. Uh, we needed to make sure that they were going to survive. Uh, so they came into our neonatal intensive care unit and uh, that's where I worked. As much fun as that was. 50 years ago, the leading cause of intellectual disabilities in the United States was a condition in some neonates that did not allow them to metabolize protein. Properly, this condition uh, caused a buildup of a waste product known as phenylketonuria. Uh, since it's a waste product, of course, it was uh, relatively destructive and it destroyed brain cells. Now, by screening all babies at birth, phenylketonurics can be placed on a special diet and live otherwise normal lives. Uh, two other problems, hypothyroidism, uh, which cause, causes cre cretinism, and uh, galactosemia, uh, also known as maple syrup disease. Uh, we screen these as well. In some states, they screen them routinely. In other states, um, they just screen for PKU, and uh, the hypothyroidism and galactosemia uh, is screened for if uh, there seems to be a need for it. Uh, once upon a time, I was working in uh, the uh, nursery in, where was it? That was in Omaha again. This was at children, uh, not children, St. Joe Hospital in, in Omaha. Uh, I went into the nursery and uh, to, to draw a PKU, a, a series of PKUs. Uh, you do it on a card, you soak up the blood on a card. Um, and I was drawing blood and I smelled, I smelled pancakes, it was the weirdest thing. Uh, so I was joking with one of the nurses and of course they can't eat uh, in, in the nursery. They, they're not allowed to eat, certainly. And uh, when I when I mentioned it, she got all upset because I was she thought I was accusing her of eating pancakes. Well, I smelled them. I did. I you know it was weird. weird. Uh, and so I I said it seems it seems to be coming from over here. 
And of course, you know, they got all all bent out of shape and, and threw me out of the nursery um, because they, they thought I was accusing them of, of, of eating pancakes. So it turned out that a doctor came in and by golly, that, that baby that I, that I pointed toward uh, had a galactosemia. And uh, its urine smelled like maple syrup. It was the oddest thing in the world. Um, so, well, of course, they started treating the baby, and everything turned out fine. Of course, they never they never apologized to me for throwing me out of the nursery. Told me never to come back. Always send somebody else. I was pretty good at it. I I could get blood from a baby fairly well. I'm good at squeezing heels, as it turns out. Uh, we saw this last time, infant mortality around the world. Um, Iceland is, has the lowest infant mortality. Russia has a pretty high infant mortality. They were right, right close to the bottom, and that's kind of tragic. Uh, the highest infant mortality rate, almost all of them are in Africa. Uh, these are all African countries except for Afghanistan, of course. Um, <clears throat> lowest infant mortality rates... Uh, most of uh, they are either in Southeast Asia, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Japan, uh, Singapore, or they're in a year, they're um, uh, Scandinavian countries, Sweden, uh, Norway, and then Austria, Belgium, Finland, France, Switzerland have a very low infant mortality rate. Ours is almost twice what everybody else's, uh, all, all the, the lowest mortality rates are. Anyway, uh, What is low birth weight? Low birth weight is less than uh, 2,500 grams, about five and a half pounds. Very low birth weight would be 1,500 grams or 3.3 pounds, and extremely low birth weight is less than 1,000 grams or 2.2 pounds. Uh, we used to weigh the, the babies, and if they were weighed less than, than two pounds, the probability of them surviving wasn't very, wasn't very good. Uh, as you can see, this is a really, really tiny baby. Um, my job, of course, was drawing blood from the babies, so uh, I'd have to draw blood from these tiny little guys without, without doing damage. It's not the easiest thing in the world. Actually, their blood vessels are right on the surface of their skin, so... Uh, it wasn't that difficult. Uh, you just needed to be really, really careful. You could, you could damage the the baby. So, and I was really good at it. Causes for low birth weight uh, in developing countries: malnourished mothers and lack of prenatal care. In developing countries, cigarette smoking. As stupid as that sounds, overall uh, multiple births, uh, maternal age, and drug use are all causes of low birth weight. Uh, you think this, oh, there we go, you think this picture is, there, is just a mock-up. Um, my great-great, my great-niece uh, took a picture just like this, holding a bottle of beer and uh, smoking uh, a cigarette uh, when she was pregnant. She thought it was funny. Uh, the reality was she was doing a lot worse than that because she was, uh, she was shooting up with heroin at the same time. Uh, idiot. Anyway. I, can, I think I can call my, my own relatives idiots when they do things like this. Baby was born with addicted, and it took them six weeks to get him, to bring him uh, off of the addiction. Uh, I haven't seen him in a couple of years. Uh, they kind of hide, hide him and, and themselves because the family's not real pleased with them because of their, all their strange habits. Consequences of low birth weight, uh, high mortality rate, of course, this is an incubator. This is what an incubator looks like. Uh, these are holes that you stick your hands in so that you can deal with the baby. Uh, but the baby's always in there. Uh, they rarely take them out. <clears throat> uh, high mortality rate, uh, low birth uh, rate for small to date infants. For maternal mal a poor m maternal mouth uh, nutrition. Illness and exposure, a low birth rate for preterm neonates, inadequately developed physical systems. This is the biggest problem. Uh, immature lungs, immature immune system, and CNS. A lot of times we have to put a respirator uh, 
put the baby on a respirator so that we can breathe for them because their lungs are, are immature. Their immune systems, that's one of the reasons why they're in, a, uh, in an incubator. Uh, sometimes, usually, there will be, especially if it's a really, really tiny baby, uh, they'll have negative pressure in there so that uh, nothing can get in. Everything is 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 blowing out. They've got to, uh, anyway, they, they've got to keep the baby um, alive and, and and, and as normal as possible. Their immune system is really quite sensitive because it's not fully developed yet. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's not easy. It's not the easiest thing in the world. Rates of low birth weight, as you can see, Sub-Saharan Africa and India are the two worst places. Uh, more than 24% of the individuals with low birth weight Treatment for low birth weight uh, infants includes kangaroo care, skin-to-skin -skin contact for two to three hours a day, uh, infant massage. Uh, massage is actually works fairly well um, with, uh, with these guys. You need to uh, uh, stimulate them, and that's the stimulation that we use. Even with assistance, low birth weight babies are at risk uh, developmentally, and of course that is the biggest worry. Uh, that's what can, kangaroo care is, skin-to-skin -skin contact. That's what the baby needs, um, is skin-to-skin -skin contact. Uh, the average baby born in the United States is 20 inches long and weighs 7.5 pounds. 95% uh, of all full-term babies weigh between 5.5 and, and 10 pounds. They are between 18 and 22 inches long. Uh, firstborns tend to be lighter than laterborns. Uh, boys tend to be slightly heavier and longer than girls. Uh, boys average 21, 22 inches at birth and 7.5 and pounds. Girls average about 7 pounds, so it's not that much different. Uh, the first few days, the neonate will lose about 10% of its body weight. Uh, most of the weight is fluid uh, buildup that the baby accumulates in the uterus for insulation after birth and padding coming through the birth canal. Uh, the baby will begin gaining weight back by the fifth day and are back to their birth weight by the 10th to 14th day. Uh, my mother uh, had uh, uh, six children. Uh, my brother, my youngest brother, was the last child born. Uh, he, and my mother thought she was going through menopause. And she didn't think she was pregnant because she thought she was going through menopause. And you can't get pregnant during menopause. It's not very common anyway. Uh, she felt like she had been pregnant for about 10 and a half months. Um, she was pretty sure when she got pregnant. Uh, so my brother was late. <laughs> he was supposed to come in in uh, May or June, and he was born in July, July 7th. Uh, kind of interesting situation. So while he was in there, uh, he was huge. He weighed he weighed like 13 pounds, uh, you know. And and all of her other babies, uh, I think I weighed uh, around eight pounds. Uh, so it was, he was huge. He was almost fully grown as a, as a baby. And of course, she had uh, she didn't have a cesarean. She had a natural childbirth. They knocked her out, of course, for the whole thing. And, uh, she, she said that uh, the first time she saw him, he had his arms and legs stuck straight out because he had accumulated so much fluid. Uh, and they, of course, they thought there was going to be damage or whatever, but he lost the fluid fairly quickly. Uh, I guess he urinated a lot and got rid of all that extra fluid. Uh, but I, uh, anyway, she, she said he looked like somebody had, had uh, injected him with water. I don't remember it. I was, uh, let's see, he was born in 54, and I was, I was five years old at the time, so I don't remember any, any of that stuff. Medical behavior and screening, uh, one minute after delivery, and then again five minutes after birth. Most babies are assessed uh, using the, the APGAR scale, and infant's uh, score may be affected by the amount of medication the mother has received. And this is a problem with uh, with juicing the, the the mother up before the baby is born. 
Neurological or cardiorespiratory conditions may interfere with one or more of the uh, vital signs. Uh, this is what the APGAR scale looks like. Uh, the APGAR scale was developed by pediatrician Virginia APGAR with APGAR, a uh, quick reference to determine the state of the neonate. How do they look? Do they, uh, do they look blue or do they look pink? Uh, do they have a pulse? Uh, is it a rapid pulse? Should be a rapid pulse because the baby just passed through the birth canal. If there is no pulse, we've got a real serious problem. Um, grimace, uh, what they're looking for is the baby uh, being irritated. Uh, if the baby has no, uh, no facial expression at all, this is not a good sign. We want the baby to be crying. Uh, that tells us that he's okay, and that tells us that his lungs are clear. Uh, activity uh, is the active. Usually they're kicking around. Uh, babies move a lot, around a lot uh, in the womb, uh, so is, is he active or is he limp? And uh, of course, respiration, is he, if he's crying, we're, we're good. If there is no crying, this is one of the reasons why they used to spank babies. You, at least they said they, you know, hang them by the heels, then hit them and spank them, uh, trying to get them to cry. Uh, one of the things they're trying to do is clear their, their respiratory uh, system, of course. Uh, but they, they need the baby to, uh, to, to at least cry. They, ne they need to them to, them to uh, uh, be able to breathe, of course. 98.6% uh, of neonates achieve an APGAR scale of between 7 and 10 within the first five minutes of life. Any score below 7 and the neonate is given assistance breathing. Uh, any score below 4 and emergency measures must be applied. And that's... That's usually why I was, uh, a lot of women gave birth in, in the Methodist hospital. Um, and that's one of, one of the reasons they did was if there, there was a potential emergency, we had a neonatal intensive care unit right there and we could take care of things. If the breathing is established or restored, no permanent damage may, may occur. We need, to get the, we need to get oxygen into the baby's brain as quickly as we possibly can. And that's one of the reasons why we want the babies to cry. Uh, that, that draws in a lot of oxygen, of course. So if there's a, a potential problem, uh, that will truncate it. Uh, my, my sister, my oldest sister, uh, she was the firstborn. I think I told you this last time. My mother thought she was uh, stillborn. Uh, she, she never moved. She just <laughs> never moved. And oddly enough, she was not much of a mover uh, later on in, uh, ap after she was born. Uh, of all the children in our family, there were six of us. Uh, she was the least active. Uh, she was the most sedentary. Uh, so she lived that way all of her life, uh, as interesting as that is. Anyway, my mother thought there was a problem, but there wasn't. She was healthy as a, as a horse. My mother was real, uh, as a real active person. Uh, compared to my mother, my sister was, was very, very sedentary. Uh, the Brazelton Neonatal uh, Behavioral Assessment Scale, the NBAS, uh, assesses neonates' responsiveness to their physical and social environment to identify problems in neurological functioning and to predict future development. Uh, the baby is born with elementary survival reflexes that may, be, that may reflect back to humans as more primitive creatures. And uh, the, this uh, film... We'll go through that if I can. There we go. Okay. All full-term newborn babies are born with some natural reflexes, including sucking, walking, holding, and the startle or morrow reflex. If all these reflexes are present, the parents can be reassured that their baby's development is normal. This will not be the same in premature babies, as they still have some way to go. Following the birth of the baby, the midwife or paediatrician will check for these reflexes. Victoria's newborn Esme is being checked out by her midwife Andrea, and she shows how her legs already know how to move in a walking motion. Consultant neonatologist Ryan Watkins is checking over three-day-old baby Tamami. So you can see her legs are flexed and moving normally and 
Her arms are slightly flexed as well. It's a bit unfair to expect this one to flex too much given the weight of the Kenyan. And you can see, and look, she's a newborn baby. Her central tone is low, so she arches over her. My hand, the baby was a month or two old. You'd expect that to be straighter and to trying to lift her head. What I can do then is just check her morrow reflex. And to do this, I just drop her backwards into the palm of my hands. It appears a little bit startling, and startle reflex is another word for it. Mm. So you can see her fling her arms out to the side and open her eyes, and then they return to the normal position. If I open her hands up, place my out of my thumb in the palm of her hand, you should find she's put my fingers. And the same thing happened on her feet. She was flexing her toes there. There you go. She's had her PKU done. She's very alert just now. Isn't she? These reflexes will disappear over time as the baby develops and becomes stronger. There we go. Uh, you saw the uh, the bandage on her heel. That was from PKU. Uh, normally, uh, PKU is done. Uh, phenylketone urea is drawn after her first meal, uh, within the first 24 hours, after she gets milk for the first time, uh, we, if uh, she has uh, a phenyl, if she is a phenylketonuric, we, what, one of the things we need to do is put her on a diet right away. And of course, they showed the moral or startle response. Uh, this is when a baby is dropped or hears a loud noise that extends its arms, legs, and fingers arches its back and draws its head back. Uh, in this case, he had her in the, uh, in the bassinet and he dropped her. Uh, didn't drop her very far, of course, but she, she flung her arms out, as you could see. This is uh, the Apgar scale, I think, I hope. Maybe not, there we go. All the way, there we go. Uh, the Apgar score was invented in 1952 by anesthesiologist Virginia Apgar. It is a scoring system ranging from 0 to 10 and is calculated by evaluating the newborn based on five criteria. Each of these criteria can be allocated a score from 0 to 2, and then the sum of these criteria will give you the total Apgar score. In the original article published by Virginia Apgar, the original components of the score were color, heart rate, reflex irritability, muscle tone, and respiratory effort. However, there is an easier way to remember these criteria by remembering the mnemonic APGAR for appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respirations. Typically, the APGAR score is calculated at 1 and 5 minutes after birth. If the score is low, you usually repeat the score later. A score of 7 and above is generally normal. Scores less than 7 are low and suggest distress of the newborn that requires some intervention, for example suctioning or stimulation. Although APGAR scores are not used to determine morbidity or mortality, lower scores are typically thought to correlate with more severe outcomes. For example, scores of 3 that are persistent can indicate long-term sequelae such as neurologic damage. However, ultimately, the purpose of the APGAR score is to determine when emergent interventions are necessary. The APGAR score is as follows. You will take a look at the newborn's appearance. If they are blue or pale, you give them zero points. Blue extremities but a pink body, you'll give them one point. And you will award two points if the body and extremities of the newborn are pink without any cyanosis. For pulse, if it is absent, you score zero points. If the pulse is less than 100 beats per minute, you'll score one point. And, in the ideal situation, the newborn's heart rate should be greater than 100 beats per minute, awarding them 2 points. For grimace, you award 0 points if there is no response to stimulation, or the baby is floppy. 1 point is awarded for grimace on suction or aggressive stimulation. And again, ideally, if the baby is crying on stimulation, you award them 2 points. For activity, if the newborn is not moving, you of course award them 0 points. If there's some flexion of the arms and legs, you award them one point. If there's active flexion against resistance, you award two points. For respirations, if they're absent, you award zero points. 
For weak, irregular, or slow respirations, one point is awarded. And if the baby is strongly crying, you give them two points. There you go, Lapgar scale. I think, yep, that's it. Okay. Okay. Uh, another uh, reflex at birth, Darwinian or grasping reflex. Uh, when the palms of the hand are, are stroked, the baby uh, will make a fist and is even able to support itself. I wouldn't uh, suggest this, but uh, he was doing this when he was playing with her with the palm of her hand. He was trying to get her to do the, the grasping reflex. Uh, tonic neck reflex. Uh, when the baby is laid down, it will extend its preferred limbs in a fencer pose and flex its uh, non-preferred side. So if the baby's right-handed, usually it will flex the left side. Rooting reflex, uh, when the mouth or the cheek is stroked, the baby will turn toward the stimulation and begin a sucking response. Uh, when I was, the very first time I went into the nursery, <laughs> there was a nurse in there, and there were, she had a newborn, and she had, she was messing around with it. She, well, not she wasn't messing around with it. She was... Uh, swaddling it, and she uh, uh, had just uh, done an apgar, and, and uh, she uh, she said, "Watch this!" And she held the baby up to her her chest, and the baby started trying to suckle. Of course, she was she had all kinds of clothes on, but that wasn't that wasn't the idea. The idea was that she was showing off the baby's ability to do the re rooting reflex. This is one of the things. This, it was when I was in the military. Uh, it's one of the things that, that all the ba all the babies that have to be checked for is all of these uh, re reflexes that the babies are supposed to have. So she was showing me that the baby was was rooting. Uh, the walking reflex when the baby is held under its arms with bare feet touching a flat surface, it will make step-like motions that look like coordinated walking, and we saw that in the film as well. Uh, swimming when the baby is put face down in water. It will lift its head and make a well-coordinated swimming movement. Uh, of course, at birth, the baby has a lot of uh, 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 extra fat, uh, water actually, water weight, and uh, the baby floats very well. Uh, the, the Babkin reflex is when the baby's palms are stroked at once, the mouth opens, eyes closed, neck flexes, and the head tilts forward. The Babinski reflex, so when the sole of the baby's feet are stroked, the toes will fan out, and the foot twists in as if uh, to grasp a branch. And of course, this is one that I used to see all the time because I had to, I had to draw blood from their heels. And for some reason, I have a picture of my son <laughs> playing uh, indoor soccer. I don't know why. I can't remember why I put that in there. And there's my grandson. Uh, playing in the dirt, obviously. He's all covered in, in dirt. This is when they lived in Florida. They live here now. They live in Clinton, Iowa. Newborns are able to demonstrate their unhappiness by crying, flailing their arms, and stiffening their bodies. Uh, when babies need something, they cry. When they are feeling sociable, they smile or laugh. Uh, when their emotions are responded to, they react in a similar manner when the emotion occurs again. Researchers have distinguished four distinctive cries that caregivers learn almost immediately. The hunger cry is a rhythmic cry that doesn't have to be associated with hunger. Uh, the angry cry is similar to the hunger cry, but with more air force through the vocal cords. Uh, the pain cry is one that we all will respond to uh, instinctively if we hear it. It's a sudden onset of loud crying with an episode of breath holding. And the frustration cry is the one that everybody ignores. Two or three drawn out cries with uh, no breath holding. And of course, uh, the ones that you uh, tend to respond to, uh, you tend to respond to the pain cry and the hunger cry, uh, the anger cry, eh, yeah, maybe, but the frustration cry, we have learned to ignore. So if you hear a baby crying uh, and it's the frustration cry, you'll probably ignore it uh, naturally, instinctively. Babies will sleep 16 to 18 hours out of every 24 hours. Unfortunately, they only sleep in four-hour sleep cycles, so rarely sleep throughout the night. 
Uh, the baby will not begin sleeping throughout the night until they are three or four months old. And of course, that's when you start really liking the baby. The baby keeps you awake at night uh, for the first three or four months. And then after they, they hit that four month mark, uh, they get themselves in a rhythm. Approximately half of the neonate's uh, sleep is taken up with REM sleep, a sleep pattern that mirrors being awake, of course. Uh, for this reason, uh, especially after the baby is, uh, when the baby is a newborn, uh, they, they wake up very easily. Uh, and for this reason, of course, you have to be quiet around the baby, uh, which is sometimes harder. You can't even talk uh, or the baby will wake up. So you got to be real careful uh, to keep the baby uh to keep the baby away from noise if it's trying to sleep. REM sleep will decrease decrease as a baby ages. At four months, the baby will only be in REM 40% of the time. By one year, the, the baby will be at, uh, close to an adult level of REM at 25%. Uh, while most children will sleep peacefully throughout the night, uh, many children uh, will have terrifying dreams toward the morning that will wake them up and not allow them to go back to sleep. Uh, these are nightmares and they occur in REM sleep and afflict females more frequently than males. Uh, my grandson would do this. He was the happiest baby I've ever been around. Uh, but uh, every once in a while he would have a dream and he would just wake up wailing. And of course, all you can do is hold them and, and, and comfort them. <clears throat> but, uh, uh, and and that's what they that's what they need. Uh, it was really kind of interesting how scared he was. Another uh, sleep affliction is night terrors. Uh, night terrors occur early in the sleep cycle during the deepest sleep. They occur most often to boys, and the child is difficult to wake and will not remember the incident in the morning. So don't ask him. Uh, when I was up at uh, Fort Belknap. There was one individual who was uh, the, the local boxing champion. He was a Golden Gloves boxing champion. He'd gone up into Canada and beaten, up, beaten all the... He was a big guy. He was a pretty big guy. Uh, but he uh, had this reputation for... You know, he'd never lost a fight, that kind of a thing. Um, he had a stepdaughter. And um, uh, one night she came out of, of her bedroom and she was... She was yelling and screaming, and he came out to see what was going on, and she cold cocked him. She hit him. She punched him in the jaw and knocked him out, uh, which was weird because, uh, well, the weird part was that nobody had ever, nobody had been able to knock him out, and she did. Uh, but the other thing was that uh, they weren't sure exactly what was going on. Um, some people in the community, you know, this is a small community. So some people in the community thought he was trying to molest her and she, she hit him. Uh, what actually had happened, and this, this took a, a, a while to figure out what was going on, but uh, I had her in class. This is when she was a teenager. Uh, I had her in class when she was in her early 20s, and we, had, we talked about it. What happened was they sent her off to uh, a boarding school after that because, well, for a lot of different reasons. One was to protect her from him, even though he was not doing anything. Uh, and the other, the other reason was that they thought maybe there was something wrong with her. Uh, so they sent her off to boarding school. And, of course, she came, eventually she came back uh, and lived with her parents again. Uh, but there, this was always a question in her mind, a question in their mind, what was going on? Uh, is she insane? Why in the world did she attack her father like that? Uh, and we figured out, between the two of us, we figured out that she was having a night terror. And, uh, and he was part of the night terror. She didn't remember it. This is the problem with the night terror. She didn't remember what she was thinking or, or, or feeling. Uh, they eventually, they, of course, they woke her up. Uh, but she didn't remember anything, and of course we we discussed it. And uh, he was a good friend of mine, uh, and uh, well, we figured out what was going on. So I, you know, there was always this barrier between the two of them. And after that, the barrier was gone. Sleepwalking is another problem that uh, children sometimes will have. 
sleepwalking occurs during the early night and the deep sleep, so the child is hard to wake and will remember nothing in the morning. Um, one time my brother was sleepwalking and he, uh, we, we, uh, we, uh, our bedrooms are upstairs and he was sleepwalking and he walked from his bedroom outside and he sat down in the middle of this dandelion patch, uh, in our front yard. Uh, and it, it was Indiana, Indiana in the springtime and Indiana in the springtime is, there's lots and lots of dew on the ground. There's always just, it's like a. It's like a pond, you know, it's got, there's so much dew on the ground. Anyway, so he sat down right in the middle of this dandelion field. And I thought I was, I followed him. I was trying to figure out what was going on. And uh, of course, I've got my pajamas on. He's got his pajamas on. It's warm enough so that we're not that cold. Um, <clears throat> and so I walked out in the yard. And of course, my, my pajama, the pants legs of my pajama bottoms, uh, got really wet because it was it's like walking through a, a, uh, a pond and of course he's sitting in this stuff so he uh, he sat there for about 15 minutes and then he got up and he went back in the house and, and went back to bed and of course I'm my pajama bottoms are just soaked I mean almost up to my knee and so I figured geez he's he's gonna think he wet the pant what is uh, what the bed and so I went up to him and I touched uh, his his leg, and even though he'd walked through the same place that I had, uh, his pants leg was completely dry. What had happened was that he had generated so much heat while he was sitting there that he kept himself dry, strangely enough, or it dried by the time he got upstairs. Anyway, his pants legs were dry and mine were wet. I had to change my I had to change my pajama bottoms uh, because they were so soaked. And he didn't, uh, and he, he never knew anything about it. I talked to him about it the next day, and he told me, I thought, I was dreaming. I was crazy. I'm not dreaming. I wasn't crazy. Uh, bedwetting or enuresis is a common problem with children after they are potty trained. About 25% uh, of four-year-olds will wet the bed occasionally, more boys than girls. Uh, bedwetting tends to run in families. Something to think about. Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, SIDS, uh, formerly called crib death, is the third leading cause of death in, uh, for infants under one year of age. However, numbers of, of deaths have in, uh, decreased by 70% since the movement to have caregivers put their babies to sleep on their backs. 2,827 babies died of SIDS in 1998. In 2018, there were 1,300 uh, deaths due to SIDS. Uh, SIDS is the leading cause of death after the neonatal period and occurs most often between one and four months of age. Factors in SIDS seem to be exposure to tobacco smoke and sleeping on their stomach. Uh, it's not just tobacco smoke, it's also marijuana uh, smoke uh, can cause the same problems. Temperament is a person's characteristic biologically based way of approaching and reacting to people in situations. Uh, New York Longitudinal Study uh, began uh, in 1956 by Thomas Chess and Birch led to the pioneering study on temperament. Uh, they de determined that there are three temperaments, easy temperament, difficult temperament, and slow to warm, uh, slow to warm up temperament. 40% of the children in the New York Longitudinal Study were easy children, thank goodness. Uh, generally, they were generally happy, rhythmic in uh, biological functioning, and accepting of new experiences. 10% were difficult children, uh, more irritable, harder to please, irregular in biological rhythms, and more intense in, uh, in expressing emotion. 15% were slow to warm up children. Uh, they were mild, but slow to, to adapt to new ch uh, people and situations. 35% didn't fit any one category neatly. Uh, luckily, both of my children were fairly easy. Uh, I had a niece, uh, the one who gave birth to the uh, heroin addicted uh, child. Um, she was very. She was a very difficult child. Never smiled. The kid never smiled. I, there was something going on with that kid. And eventually, of course, um, uh, as she got older, went through adolescence. Uh, she developed schizophrenia. <clears throat> So maybe that has something to do with uh, her grouchiness all, all, almost all of her life. The match between the child's temperament and environmental in, uh, demands, constraints, 
demands and constraints uh, the child has to deal with is known as goodness of fit. Sometimes they fit into their, their family, sometimes they don't. Uh, trouble may occur if the overly active child is expected to sit still for long periods of time. Uh, so what would happen with this child, they would diagnose them with, um, with ADHD. A slow to warm up child is pushed into new situations. And of course, uh, we've seen that in movies. A persistent child is constantly taken away from uh, absorbing projects. Temperament can be measured using the uh, parental uh, Rothbart Infant Behavior Questionnaire. Uh, researchers have found temperament largely inborn and probably hereditary. Temperament is fairly stable. Reevaluation at seven years yielded very similar results as were obtained at birth. Temperament can change during the early months in response to parental attitudes and treatments. And of course, one of the problems that we have seen is if the mother is a crack crackhead, then one of the things that she she doesn't really pay a lot of attention to her child. If the mother is suffering from postpartum depression, uh, she doesn't pay enough attention to her child. And of course, that can change the child's temperament. The shyest children account accounted for about 15% of the sample. Uh, they tended to have blue eyes, thin uh, faces, allergies, constipation, and unusual fears. Uh, the boldest children, 10 to 15%, tended to be uh, energetic and spontaneous. They, the inhibited children that were allowed to be so tended to stay inhibited. In other words, if they were shy and they were allowed to stay shy, they stayed shy forever. Among Canadian in inhibited children at two, their mothers tended to be punitive or overprotective. Uh, the children tended to be seen as incompetent, immature, and unlikely to accomplish much. Among the Chinese inhibited children at two, their mothers were more accepting and encouraging, even though the children were more inhibited than the Canadian children. In China, of course, inhibited and shy children are socially approved, but not in Canada. Patterns of growth, uh, children grow faster during the first three years, especially during the first few months, than they ever will again. This rapid growth rate uh, tapers off during the second and third years. By, the, by five months, the average baby boy has doubled his birth weight, and he will triple it by one year. By his second birthday, a boy will only add five more pounds to his weight. A boy's height will typically increase by 10 inches in the first year to 30 inches. Uh, they will gain five inches in height the second year to three feet tall. Uh, a baby begins teething at three to four months, but they typically don't emerge until the fifth to ninth month. At one, they will have uh, six to eight teeth. Uh, by two and a half, they will have a mouthful of 20. There's my grandson when he was a little, a little shaver. <laughs> Uh, he wasn't drinking the Coke. He just liked to carry the cans around. Uh, he, we were at my uh, brother's house, my mother's house, uh, the homestead, uh, and uh, my brother drinks Coke. And you can see his Coke is back here. Well, you can see the Coke back in the back, uh, the glass of Coke. Uh, he wasn't after the Coke. He just wanted to carry the can around. And he was teasing his, his uncle, of course, his great uncle. Uh, because he was stealing his, his Coke can. So that's why he's laughing so hard. You can see he's a blue-eyed baby. Uh, his hair is dark now. His hair is no longer blonde. He was born a blonde, and now he has almost black hair. Uh, in the womb and after they are born, children develop from head to tail. This is known as cephalocaudal, and from the inside out, proximal distally. Uh, the head and the brain are the largest thing about the developing fetus and a newborn. At two months, uh, gestation takes up to, to one half the body length. At birth, it takes up one uh, quarter of the body length. As adults, our heads are about one eighth of our body length. And there you go. Uh, somebody changing, a female changing, and there's a male changing. And we see exactly the same thing. Influences on growth genes interact with environment. Uh, for example, uh, nutrition and living conditions impact general health and well-being. Uh, well-fed, well-cared-for children grow taller and heavier 
and less well-nourished and nurtured children, uh, better medical care, immunization, and, and antibiotics have led to better health. Bottle feeding babies did not become possible until the 17th century in Europe. Before that time, if a mother didn't want to breastfeed her own baby because of inconvenience or sagging breasts, she would find another woman and have her breastfeed uh, for her. Uh, this woman was known as a wet nurse. In the 19th century, an increase in infant deaths was blamed on wet nurses and bottle feeding. In the 1920s, bottle feeding became popular and didn't go out of vogue until the 1970s when the Le Le Leche movement, movement started and women started breastfeeding again. Uh, breast milk is almost always the best food for newborns and is recommended for at least the first 12 months. Uh, parents can avoid obesity and cardiac problems in themselves and their children by adopting a more active lifestyle for the entire family uh, and to breastfeed their babies. At birth, the brain weighs about 25% of its eventual adult weight of 3.5 pounds. By th age 3, the uh, brain will be 90% of its total size. By age 6, it is almost at, at its adult size. Building the brain, uh, the brain's maturation uh, takes much longer than was previously thought. Uh, brain growth spurts co coincide with changes in cognitive behavior. Uh, examples would be the learning of language and uh, environmental stimulation. Uh, you learn a language uh, from your from the first moment you're alive until about your age 12. By that time, you have all the uh, uh, language skills that you really need to communicate. Um, spatialization of the hemisphere. This is called lateralization. Uh, the left side is for language, and the right side is for visual spatial knowledge. The brain represents 70% of the weight of the nervous system. The occipital lobe is for the visual information. The occipital lobe, wait a minute, let me do this. Okay, let's do it again and so I can get my arrow. There we go. There's the occipital lobe right here. The temporal lobe is, is uh, right around your ears. This is in the back of the brain. Uh, this is in the, on the side of your head, uh, in your temper, temples. Uh, that's where hearing and language takes place. Uh, parietal lobe is on top, right up here. Uh, that's touch and spatial uh, uh, information. And the frontal lobe is where all your higher uh, uh, level thinking is t takes place, as well as your reason and uh, your speech pattern. Uh, the role of experience, smiling, babbling, crawling, walking, and talking are possible due to rapid development of the brain, particularly the cerebral cortex. Plasticity is uh, where uh, the brain is mo modifiable. Um, we are able to mold it, and that's known as plasticity. Throughout early life, the brain is creating more and more complex neuronal uh, pathways. Even before birth, it really all depends on the stimulation in the environment. And this is really something that's very important. This is why we try to start stimulating babies uh, at birth. Uh, a baby in an incubator, a lot of times, will put uh, black and white pictures so that there's stimulation uh, for the baby. Uh, and that's what we want to do. We want to continually stimulate them. Even before birth, the brain is integrating uh, neuronal coordination of muscle groups, a process known as integration. At the same time, select neurons are being developed to have a specialized structure and function, a process known as differentiation. When neuronal cell uh, functions are no longer needed or no longer used, cell death occurs and the body prunes the excess brain cells. Uh, early experience can have lasting effects on emotional development and the capacity of the central nervous system to learn and store information. Sometimes corrective experience can make up for past deprivation, um, but not always. Myelin, a fatty insulating substance, begins about halfway through the gestation in some parts of the brain and continues into adulthood in others. This accounts for improving abilities at various times during adulthood. <clears throat> 
Babies first learn simple skills and then combine them in increasing, increasingly com complex systems of action. Humans begin to walk later than other species, possibly because babies' heavy heads and short legs make balance difficult. One test that has been developed to chart motor development is the Denver Developmental Screening Test that charts a child's progress and compares it to other children or of similar age and gender. <clears throat> According to Thalen, normal babies develop the same skills in the same order because they are built approximately the same way and have similar physical challenges and needs. Not until babies can get around by themselves do they learn from experience or from a caregiver's warnings that a steep drop-off can be dangerous. If there is a chance to, if there are chances to explore their surroundings, motor development is more likely to be normal. Some cultures actively encourage early development of motor skills. Uh, they will actually massage their babies, uh, and they'll start massaging the babies at birth, um, so that they will develop normally. Uh, Gessel concluded that children perform certain activities when they are ready and, and training gives no advantage. Findings do not indicate whether changes in the brain or in muscle strength or both are involved in, in motor development, but they do suggest the interaction of biology and environment. Touch team seems to be the first sense to develop. Pain experienced during the neonatal period may sensitize an infant to later pain perhaps by affecting the neural pathway that process uh, painful stimuli. A preference for a pleasant odors uh, seems to be learned in utero and during the first few days after birth. Preference for the fragrance of the mother's breast may be a survival mechanism. Newborn's reject or of, uh, rejection of bitter tastes is probably another survival mechanism since many bitter substances are toxic. Hearing is functional uh, before birth. Auditory discrimination develops rapidly after birth. Uh, hearing is a key to language developing so uh, language development. So hearing Im impairments should be identified as early as possible. Vision is the least developed since at birth. Vision becomes more acute during the first year, reaching the 2020 uh, level by about the sixth month. Binocular vision is where the individual uses both eyes to focus. This leads to the perception of depth 